Oh, but I can hear the praises of God's people. And I'm so excited today to still be alive on this planet that I can adjudicate the will of God, the purpose of God, and who He is. Oh, glory be to God. You may be seated if you can. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Thank y'all so much for the worship. I just love worshiping God. And I missed all of y'all last Sunday, but we had to use some wisdom. And we just do what we have to or need to. And sometimes we just do what God says do, and it goes against everything. It seems like, doesn't it? But it's going to be a great year. Last year was a great year. <laughs> well, it was. Man, you wouldn't be where you're at today if it wasn't for uh, last year. That's where we are. Can you say amen? Well, I've just got so much to say and so much to do. So what I'm just going to simply do is I've got a little note just to help me stay on course. I really do. I've got a lot to say and a little bit of time to say it. I just want to talk a little bit and, and then we'll share a little bit and move in communion because 2020 was uh, a very unusual year. We remember this time last year celebrating, you know, 19 going out and 20 coming in and what 20 meant and so excited. And then 20 got started and then here come all kind of curveballs, you know, and then the, the C word and all the other. It just stuff just started happening. And, and the body of Christ, I'm here to tell you, she's a great voice in this country. Because while everybody's being shut down and everything, it was the churches that were beginning to speak out. And did you hear what Attorney Powell said yesterday? Oh, Lord have mercy. Announced to the whole nation on public television. I wish to God that every church in America would open up tomorrow morning and fill their churches up with praise and worship and I want to see them arrest 75 million Americans for worshiping God she said come on church where are you I thought hey the shield we're here can somebody say amen hey I know things don't look good out there I know that but when I read my Bible I've never seen anything looking great and then God moved they always stopped and said, hey, look at them big giant waves just frozen so we can walk through here. How long are they going to be standing up there? Hello? Hey, look behind us. There's an army on our rear end. We've got walls of water and there's nowhere to go. What do we do? Trust God. And did you know that they say that where Pharaoh's army was drowned, they say that that is no more than six inches of water oh I know the natural mind says we'll see then it didn't happen I think it's amazing that God can take six inches of water and can make dry ground for his people to go across and still take six inches of water and drown an entire army their horses their chariots their soldiers and everything they've got six stands for man anyway so we in a new day we're at a very, very, what would I put it? We're at the threshold, literally threshold. You know, I remember when I picked Kathy up a long time ago and we were going over the threshold, first time ever. That's where I'm at right now. I'm ready to go over a brand new one. Oh, this isn't in my sermon, but let me just, it's been on me. Let me put these on so I can see it better. Next time y'all buy me a Bible, get me one with bigger print. But this is so good, it really is. It has nothing to do with what I prepared today. It really doesn't. But while we were worshiping, the Spirit of the Lord moved on me and I opened this up and went back a page and did what he said and whoa. I just wanna read this to you. Out of the Passion, this, this is in chapter four of 2 Corinthians and it's very unique because it starts in verse seven talking about that we are a treasure in clay jars hello we take good care of our clay jars we like our clay jars we love our clay jars but the treasure is not the clay jar it's in the clay jar we are like common clay jars that carry this glorious treasure within 
so that or- extraordinary overflow of power can be seen as God's and not ours. And though we experience every kind of pleasure, we're not pressure, we're not crushed. At times, we don't know what to do. Quit. How you say it? Quit. Little high-pitched voice. The higher it gets pitched, the more you mean no, don't you? Quit. (laughs) Who you talking to? We are persuaded by others. We We are persecuted by others. But God has not forsaken us. And we may be knocked down. But somebody help me. Can't knock me out. And we continually what? Share in the death of Jesus. And see, when you hear the word death of Jesus, people literally think die, die, die. But the death of Jesus is all about the resurrection of the life of God. Because it's in his death does resurrection come forth. Hallelujah. So in him do I live and move and have my being. The death of Jesus in our own bodies. He didn't just die on the cross. He dies in me every day. Did you ever think about that? Do you know why? Because he didn't just do everything for you. He did it as you. We stand in the stead of Christ. Everything about you is the same to God as Jesus. No different. The love that he has for you is no different than Jesus Christ. The word says so. He loves us so much. We're continually sharing the death of Jesus as our own bodies. So the resurrection life will be revealed through our humanity. We consider living to mean that we are constantly being handed over to death for Jesus, for his sake. So that the life of Jesus will be revealed through our humanity. So then death as it work in us, but it releases life in you. We've got that same spirit of faith. What's this? Same spirit of faith. It's described in the scriptures when it says... First I believe, hello, then I what? If you do not speak, faith is not released. If you do not act, faith is not acted on. Speak and act. He says, so we also first believe and then we speak in faith. Man, that's exciting. I first believed and I spoke in faith. And faith in God has redeemed me. It has blessed me and strengthened me. And now I can wake up and I can look at the world and I can look at the past and I don't have to dwell on it. I look at it as the foundation and the ladder that has been laid for me to climb for today. Now this is gonna sound very simple, but please listen to me. The past, there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing, but watch this. When the past is over, which is like every second, what are you left with? To deal with your future. So I don't live dealing with my past. I live dealing with my future. My past is my experience. The wisdom of God in my past has superbly taken me above my experiences and now I'm moving into revelation knowledge now is what has been revealed in me that moves me it's not the things that my physical body likes to touch and feel it is him it is all of his own being that is in us he breathes in us he lives in us when you get married and become intimate he loves it because he wants you to know that in that marriage in that intimacy That's the way it is between just you and him, married to Christ. There's an intimacy between God and his bride. And so when we learn that we're not into the gender, I am the bride of Christ. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not some old dirty old man. I'm not a worm anymore. I'm not an unrighteous scumbag. Hallelujah. I've been washed in the blood. I've been cleansed. I've been redeemed. Oh, when I was a little boy, I'd pedal my bicycle down Oakland going down to the S&H Green Stamp store because nobody saved Green Stamps like I did. I lived beside a store, and I was always out picking the Green Stamps up, putting them in a book all the time. And all my friends would be like, what are you doing? I said, man, this is like money. 
this stuff is like money. And I'd get two, three books, and I'd pedal that bike down to that store, and I'd go in and look at the magazines and the shelves and just dream. 10, 11 years old, I want a knife and a hatchet, you know. I need a sleeping bag and a tent. I need some stuff. And so I'd go in there, and I'd dream, and finally, and I'd ask them, is this enough books to get that up there? And they'd get, I think they blessed me a little bit. I remember this one lady, I kept going, you sure that's not enough stamps to get that? And she handed me that hatchet and just smiled, and I don't know how many stamps I was short. But oh, God bless that woman. Well, I'm just saying that while I was there, we were talking one day. And the guy, one guy explained to me that what my book was in my hand was holding what was in the back room on the shelf. And he said, and when you bring it in and you release it, he said, then what's back there comes out and jumps on you. Well, I didn't realize it later in life that that was going to be a spiritual principle that if I would turn loose what God has put in me, it's going to leak back on me big time. And that's what I loved about going up there with them stamps is because I learned about redeeming. And what I found out was what was in my hands was as worth as much or more than what was on the shelf. And when I traded the book or when Jesus traded his blood for what was in the shelf in the back, you, then when he got it, it was called redeemed. Now, redeemed is one of the most precious things in the world because it means to be restored and put back together greater than you were in your original position. Greater. Did you know a 1957 Chevrolet, brand new, cost $1,775? But a 1957 Chevrolet totally restored, in excellent condition, better than new, they go around 120,000 now. Well, can you imagine how much value you've increased over the years? See, so you thought you were sitting out there rusting. Mm -mm. No, baby, you're not a rust bucket. Are you hearing me? Oh, and I forgot to tell y'all, I did get tested and I'm supposed to announce this, it's by law. I got tested and I was tested positive two weeks ago. They gave me a big test. And uh, when they come up and said, Mr. Souls, you're positive. And I said, so? I've always been positive. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it wasn't a Corona test. It was the baptism of the Holy Ghost test. And I came out positive. So I thought it's time to start testing some people. We need to put up some testing tents and you guys come by and let's swab your lips and let's find out what your mouth's got to say. Are you guys all right out there? Oh, all right, I see it. They flash into time at me. You better move up. They know I'm so far behind because I'm gonna give them scriptures and I'm not in any of them. So anyway, let me just slow down here you know your treasures in them clay jars. Look at somebody and say, hey, clay jar. Yeah, your clay jar is just your buddy, but it's what's in that jar you are to be in love with. Amen? All right, well, let me move on here. Got a lot to say. Now, let me explain this. I'm going to bounce around, so just hang with me. Are you all right? All right, this particular wooden hammer... I've already busted it. I can see cracks in it. I've hit everything around here with this thing so hard. But anyway, this hammer, and it's heavy. It's a, it's a good one. That's a good little podium. But this come off of a tree, an 80-foot oak tree that the third hurricane that hit Monroe, Louisiana, over by Dr. Clarice's Fluids home and Dr. Liz Sharp. And a big 80-foot oak tree come through Liz's home. It cut her house in half. It pinned her in. And she wasn't, she's like most of us at nighttime, bedtime, not wearing much. And then, boom, her house gets ripped open. She's pinned in, hard to get out. She climbs and climbs and climbs. She gets out with hardly any clothes on at all, and everything's a disaster. And it, everything she's got is wiped out. The, I mean, it's just terrible. You would think that she would just get mad and cuss, wouldn't you? 
But you know what she done? She went and got a chainsaw. You don't ever tick off a Holy Ghost woman. They're more dangerous than a Holy Ghost man. And so she gets a chainsaw. And she named the tree the weapon of mass destruction. And they made 16 hammers out of that tree. Do you remember the Sunday? It was around my birthday. And Clarice Fluid said, Larry, there's something very important and special coming in the mail to you. You remember that? And see, y'all thought, oh, she's sending him some money. She sent me something money can't buy, honey. Well, I was the last one to get a hammer. My hammer's been everywhere. Everybody's come in but mine. And then we'd look on the internet and they would be, it'd be, what is it, Cat Kerr. She held a hammer up like this. I said, Cat got my hammer. So I was after Cat Kerr for a while and find out what you doing with my hammer. And then some more prophets popped up and they had hammers. Well, what they done is they send these to 16 prophets around the nation to cover several different states for each one. I do the Carolinas. I don't call myself a prophet. I don't expect myself to be a prophet. But for some reason, they call me, they sent me the hammer and told me I was drafted, that I had no choice. And I said, you cannot draft me. And she said, well, you are. I said, I am not, I'm joining. You never draft me. I always go willingly. Somebody say amen. So I joined. And after I joined, I found out that my instructions are to get up early every morning. And for two hours, all of us are on the phone with Dr. Clarice Fluitt, basically at the helm, governing everything. And oh my God, if I had the time to tell y'all what I have been hearing, it's, but so much is, I'm serious, it's so confidential. I can tell you this, the media doesn't know poop. Oh, oh, I'm, I know, you turn it on and there they are in their suits and they're looking good. And they've got their sounds and their pandemic music and they're putting it out there. They're so full of bull. Listen, if I wasn't in church and I could get you outside, I could tell you what they were full of. And I'm gonna tell you it's not good. Are you all right? Don't you listen to them. I honestly do not pay them any attention anymore. I quit just paying them any attention. Clarice Fluitt said this, find you a trusted news source, go there for about 10 minutes, because after 10 minutes, it's repeat, 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 repeat. Find out what they, you think they're saying that you trust. You got something you can pray about and do about, go on. Don't live in front of that TV and listen to them, they're liars. I said they're liars. Yes, they are. And somebody ought to say it. They just announced me on the internet as a religious leader. They don't know how daggum wrong they are. I hate religion. I'm a Holy Ghost leader. <laughs> religion stinks. It'll eat you up and spit you out. But you listen to me. The Spirit of God's moved supernaturally and he sent hammers around to the prophets of the nations. And early in the morning while most are sleeping, we're interceding and praying and decreeing and speaking the word over our nation, the leadership, the politics, over our schools and our children and our government, everything that's concerning every one of us. And then when all of a sudden, we keep telling one to the other, what are you hearing from God? And they'll say, what are you hearing? And they'll say, and it's funny, they keep doing that. And when they get to me, I'm the weird one. I'm the odd one. I don't have all that stuff they have. I keep bringing them to shepherds and I keep bringing them back to the church and back. I keep telling them to the prophets and I say it to them on the phone. I know you hate being told that you're a pastor. Oh, you prophets and you evangelists are always screaming, I'm no pastor. But when you wake up and realize, oh yes, you are because you have been given the office of a prophet and that is a pastoral ministry because it's a shepherding gift that Jesus gave to the church and you can find it in Ephesians 4.11 that he gave apostles and prophets 
prophets, evangelists, and pastors, and teachers to equip the saints, to perfect the saints, to do what? To go do the work of the ministry. So prophets, yes, you are. You quit saying you don't want to smell like sheep. If you don't smell like sheep, you stink yourself. God wants you to get down with sheep, and he wants you to let them know what's the word of the Lord and that you love them like a shepherd. Hey, you evangelists, quit preaching and blowing in and blowing out. Hang around and lay hands on the sick and minister to them, love of them. Why? Because you've got the spirit of a pastor on you. Have I got a spirit of a pastor? I'm an evangelist. Have I got a spirit of a pastor? I'm a prophet. He gave shepherding gifts. That's pastoring gifts. And yes, a pastor, pastors, he feeds the flock. But you got to understand every one of them is a pastor. Teacher, you're a pastor. Evangelist, you're a pastor. Prophet, you're a pastor. And yes, you can call them pastors even if they get mad. Hello? Hello, Pastor Prophet. Don't you call me that. Well, anyway, I get all the weird little stuff. And I get the stuff about forsake not the assembling of ourselves. I give them the illustration of the bicycle. They went nuts with it. And the next thing I knew, that illustration went crazy for about three days. Guess what they're talking about? Tightening up the loose nuts and the boats and the wobbly bicycles that are getting loose and they're not being attended to. It just kept going and going. And now they're all fired up. Glory to God. And we're all getting our bicycles ready. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But the stuff that is getting ready to break loose, the six is going to be a real huge day. The six is going to be big, real big. But here's the thing. You can't get your eyes on a political party or just a man. I know that we see and we care. I understand that. But you got to understand, it's not about a man and it's not about a political party. It's about the destiny of the United States. This country was birthed by God for the very reason of the gospel, a place to be free to preach it and teach it, and a place of freedom to send it all over the world, from right here in America. And it's not over. The prophets know it's not over. God's not finished. Too much for me to say, I can't tell you. Let me ask you this. How many of you know how much China owns America? Do you have any idea? 72% of it. I said, you own 28% of your country. China owns 72% of your country. The biggest communist, I'm talking about antichrist spirit. And you better hear me. Socialism is an antichrist spirit. The whole motivation behind socialism and communism is to destroy Christianity. It has no place there. It is not welcome. They're not going to announce it loudly. But if this nation ever goes socialism, that's where you're going to find out who your true prophets and pastors really are. The ones that will stand up into the face of the law and authority and decree the will of God. And those that will just go out of the door, get in their car and go home and say, oh my God. I'm like the Apostle Paul, man. (laughs) You know, I would just rather go ahead and go on and be with everybody that's left. But guess what? It's more needful that we all be together because we have things to deal with before we leave. We have seed in the earth that's going to be here when you're gone. It's time for you to dig the ditches for them. Are you hearing me? We are the pioneers for those that are here. We're cutting some trees down so our little kids won't have to go through it. I don't like the government sending me money and going to build my great-grandbaby. No way, baby. This thing's going to turn around. Somebody say amen. We're turning it around with prayer, turning it around with power. And then every morning after we spend about two hours hearing the word of the Lord from each other and what God is saying, we begin to worship. And we begin to just pray. And we take communion every morning. I've been taking communion every morning for weeks every day every day and it's it doesn't get old it's the blood and the body of newness and freshness revitalization healing and strength it puts me back where i'm supposed to be are you guys okay so we take the hammer and when they call out when to hit then we start beating i've done beat my office all to pieces i'm gonna have to get another office glory to god Well, they should have never sent me a hammer. Why? Because it's symbolic. Let me tell you something. There's no power in a wooden hammer. There's no power in this little old 
tiny metal cross. No power at all. There's not a bit of power in that oil. None. Nothing. But when you lay your hands on it and you speak words over it and you release an action to it, what did we just read? Them treasures in the jar, what do they do? They believe and they speak. That's the treasure in the jar is the revelation to know that what you say is going to come to pass. And when you say it, you know it's coming to pass. When I'm talking, I'm not just talking to the air. I'm believing the air is being filled with substance. That there's a magnetic force in the power of words. This is a scientific fact, by the way. And when you speak, it goes into the universe searching what you said. And it catches it and magnetically brings it into you. It's called the law of attraction. What you say and what you think is so connected to the universe, it is waiting on you. You want some scripture? The earth is moaning and groaning for a manifestation of who? Sons of God. That's men and women. Sons of God. The earth. You hear in all this climate change, the earth is burping, belching, opening up, closing back up, hotter than it's ever been, colder than it's ever been, more snow than there's ever been. Didn't snow at all and it's always snowed there. So what the world? The, the world's got, no, 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 no. It's not the earth or the people and it's not your SUV. It's not. I know you think it's the tobacco plant, but it's not. It's the earth itself is like a womb and it is pregnated with the sons of God and their purpose is to manifest. Manifest God himself in the earth with his voice, his word, his body. See, once you've been in the body of Christ, you're not a regular body anymore. Now I'm in the body of the anointing. And so I walk with a new purpose and a new authority because God's word is like a hammer that crushes the rocks. That means everything the world knows, knowledge, it crushes those rocks in pieces. Words, when you realize that your mouth is like this hammer and when you speak, that thing comes down. Now oh, this is a good hammer. It looks like an arm and hammer on a soda box, doesn't it? Lord have mercy. But let me tell you, your words, as a matter of fact, I jotted it down. This is what Clarice has been hitting us with all week. How do you see yourself and how do you see yourself for 2021? I can tell you, I see myself with a hammer because his word is like a hammer. I see myself full of his word and I am like the pen of a ready writer. I'm ready to talk. I'm ready to speak. I'm ready to walk. I'm ready to lay hands. I'm ready. Hey, T.D. Jake said, are you ready? You ready? You ready? You ready? You ready? Okay, T.D., I'm ready, 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 ready. And I'm gone, 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 gone. Y'all coming with me? Let's go do this. Then when we get through beating everything to pieces, we talk about how we see ourselves in Christ Jesus. And Clarice said, always see yourself <laughs> with a hammer and a bow and an arrow all the time. You're always ready to deliver the will and the purpose of God. And man, the bow and the arrow be in your tongue and your words, shoot straight and don't you miss. The hammer being the word of the Lord, when you swing it, it crushes. You know something? God puts all these little symbols out there to show you how powerful it is. A shofar, just a ram's horn. God said to the Israelites, when you get there to your enemies, just blow the ram horn and wave your banners. And so here comes the enemy and they're going, look at them bunch of weird freaks. They got flags and banners and horns. <laughs> We're going to fight people with flags and horns. And they're standing out there with bad swords and everything. They're ready to kill. And then all of a sudden, the breath of God comes out of God's people through a ram's horn. And the ram is symbolic for what? The sacrifice. And then the sound out of the horn puts so much fear 
and all the Hittites and the Canaanites, they all dropped all of their weapons. Now, anybody that's a combat soldier knows that's the one thing you don't drop. Even if you run, carry your weapon with you. They dropped everything and they run and start terror. And all the body of Christ did was wave banners and blow horns. Just wave a banner and blow a horn. I mean, that just does not make a bit of sense. It might not make sense, but it sure is wonderful to watch a sorry, corrupt army run in stark terror because all you did was praise God. That's what it represents is praise to him. Praise steals the enemy. It stops him. That's the reason you'll flesh. I can tell you if you're religious or not. You come to church and they sing that song too many times. They sing over and over and over. You just need your mind renewed. I'm serious. When I hear you talk like that old squeaky wheel going in your brain, you need some oil on it. They sing it over and they sing it over and they sing it over. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost and you start singing to God over and over, you'd be like a needle stuck on a record, man. You're just loving it. Oh, I know. I remember the 60s with Percy Sledge when a man loves a woman. I remember being on Carolina Avenue in the summertime and everybody's doors are open and you could see the teenagers laying on the couch and you could hear that song coming out the door. And the next night you'd walk by their house, same song, and they still on the cotton picking couch. And you could just see it everywhere you walk and you could hear Percy when a man loves a woman. He'd turn his back on his best friend if he put her down. And you know, after about the end of summer, you went, how long are they going to listen to that song? Well, that man and that woman's loving that song. Are y'all hearing where I'm coming from? I believe God is just like that when you start worshiping him. When God loves his woman, woo, he'd turn his back on the universe <laughs> for this good thing he found. Mm. And what was that other If you don't think another woman to have your man, just throw him out there on the street. <laughs> and then some other woman going to have him before you can count. One, two, three. Oh, well. All right, let's get back to the word. <laughs> I was in the word. You just didn't know it. Bless your heart. All right. I want to... <laughs> I want to start moving into communion because communion is so awesome. And out of the passion, I'm going to read a little bit about the reconciliation. Can I still read a little bit? I'm not trying to make it a long sermon. It's not even a sermon. Today is like an announcement that it's a new year and we're more than ready for it. And we have taken charge over the past. We are ready for what is set before us and we have no fear. And I'm telling you, we're going to win souls this year. We're going to build buildings this year. We're going to touch other people. We're going to help the police department. We're going to help the fire department. I'm serious. We're going to pave our parking lot. We're going to see God move around the city of Rock Hill in some awesome areas. And we're going to watch Corona dry up and die because we are the body of Christ and we have the right and dominion and authority to speak the word of the Lord over everything that's happening in the earth. And I decree in the name of Jesus, Corona, you are a virus. You are a name under the name of Jesus. I rebuke you. I curse you. I command you. Dry up and die in the name of Jesus. And I wished our politicians would understand how important it is to let God rule. Because the Bible says that when, when, when the Lord reigns and rules, the people rejoice. And we like being happy. And so all I've got to say to the government is I, I love you, I care about you, and I pray for you, but you're supposed to work for us. I don't work for you. I'm not supposed to be a socialist giving you my money. You're supposed to be doing what I say you should do, and I'm keeping my money. Hallelujah. Well, since we are of those who stand in a holy awe of God, Oh, hallelujah. This is verse 11 in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. We're going to go to communion here. We're going to make it our passion to persuade others to turn to him. And we know our lives are transparent before God who knows us fully. And I hope that all we also, well known to your consciousness. And again, I love this. Again, we are not taking an opportunity to brag, 
but we're giving you some information that will enable you to be proud of us and to answer those who esteem outward appearances over overlooking that which is of the heart. And if we are out of our minds, <laughs> and hopefully you are, and if you are out of your minds, in a blissful, divine ecstasy. You see what happens when you're out of your mind? It's awesome. It is. He says it's for God. If you're out of your mind, it's for God. But if you're in your mind, but if we're in our right minds, it's for your benefit. For if it is Christ's love that fuels our passion and motivates us because we're absolutely convinced that he has given his life for all of us, then this means all died. Not some, all died with him. We all died with him. So he didn't just die for me, he died as me. So those who live should no longer live self-absorbed lives, but lives that are poured out for him. The one who died for us and now lives again. So then from now on, we have a new perspective that refuses to evaluate people merely by their outward appearance. For that's how we once viewed the anointed one. Mm. But no longer do we see him, Jesus, with limited human insight. Now, if anyone, as King James would put it, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature and old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. He's now Superman. The passion now, if anyone is enfolded into the anointing Christ, the Messiah, he has become an entirely new person why would I want to go to the past I've got this new guy I got to deal with I'm new every morning I'm fresh and new every morning because God's faithfulness is so fresh and so new that when we meet each other every morning it's a fresh new day yesterday's forgiven yesterday's behind me and the only thing I can do about yesterday with wisdom is everything that I shouldn't have done yesterday I won't do today seriously that's what yesterday, that's all the past should mean to you. Hey, my wife was a big part of my past. It could have been either way. It could have been her. It could have been me. I have to look at this, and this sounds tacky. But what God showed me was this. And it does, it sounds tacky. This is not taking any love from her at all. But the past is the past. It just is. A grave is a grave. But. After your past, you have to face your future. And it doesn't matter what or who you buried yesterday. When you wake up this morning, it's a new day. Now, you can lean on yesterday. You can recry. You can just regurgitate. And you can just chew on that same old stuff and swallow it again. Or you can say, no way. I am a new man in Christ Jesus, the head and not the tail. Yes, there's things in the past I loved and it was awesome and I'm grateful for it. But glory be to God, I got a feeling the past does not reveal what the future is holding. And regardless of how many families and friends, if I'm still here, it must be a miracle. If you are still here, you, that must be a miracle. Look at you. What have you been through in your life? How many times have you almost come to death? What, I mean, what's happened to you that people have no idea how much it is a miracle of God you're here today? That you're just sitting here. The plan and the purpose of God is going to flow through you and in you and out of you. And God's going to get glory. And the devil wants to get on the media and harp through your TVs and have you in fear, scared while you're eating supper, talking about what you heard at the news at the table. The table's a place of communion and laughter and fun and family love. That's not where you sit and gripe and complain. Are you all right? So if anybody is enfolded in Christ, he's become an entirely new person. And all that's related to the old order, it has vanished and behold, everything's fresh and it's new. And God has made all things new. 
That's why when I run into people and they go, oh yes, I've heard of you. You used to sell dope on Duke Power when you was working out there. I know you. You used to get drunk. You used to get stoned. I know you. I saw you on your motorcycle leaving clubs so wobbly. I know you. No, you don't know me. That was an old man. Now you're talking about dumb. That was an old man. Because I've done it all. I'm just glad I got saved at 24. I don't think I'd have lived to 25. <laughs> Y'all funny. But it's the truth. And have you ever noticed when people get saved, some of them will say, you wouldn't believe what I gave up for the Lord. I, what did you give up for him? Hell? Well, bless your heart. We're just real proud of you. <laughs> yeah, let go of the devil and got God. Aren't you something? Oh, well. And then he reconciled us to himself and he gave us a ministry. This is every person in this church has this ministry. This is your ministry. I mean, if some of you had, oh, God would show me. A okay. Lord said, give it to you right now. And given us the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling others to God. In other words, it was through the anointed one that God was shepherding the world, not even keeping records of their sins. He wasn't even keeping a record while you were doing it. You were. He doesn't keep the record. Not even keeping records of your transgressions. And he has entrusted to us the ministry of opening the door of reconciliation to God. And look who you are now. Look at all you ambassadors. Look at the person beside you and say, hello, ambassador. Oh, yes. Yeah, you're sitting with some great people. And we are ambassadors of who? The United States of America? The anointed one who carries the message of Christ to the world. As though God were tenderly <laughs> pleasing with them directly through our lips. Through our lips. Through our lips. I believe. And therefore have I spoken. How do you get saved? Believe in the heart. God raised Jesus from the dead. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. What was that? Believing and speaking. Believing and speaking. Say what you believe. So we tenderly plead with you on Christ's behalf. Turn back to God. Be reconciled to him. For God made the only one who did not know sin to become sin. I love this. I'm telling you, listen. He made, he became your sin. He's not a sinner. He became your sin. And so God, for God made him the only one who did not know sin to become sin for us so that we who did not know righteousness, look what he says might become the righteousness of God through my union with him. In other words, his shed blood and my union with him has made me in right standing with God. I have such a right standing with God right now that the world is going nuts and going crazy and he's looking at me and he's going, now don't you go crazy with them. I need you to be the rudder on the ship. The church is the tongue for the condition of the earth. And wherever it's going, it's whatever the church is saying. I have something very disturbing. I, I don't even want to get into it, to be honest with you, because I don't want to talk about it right now. But it bothers me. Now, if you don't think there's some ignorant, and I, when I say ignorant, if you don't think there's some ignorant believers, if there's a such thing, listen to this statement. The Pope, the Pope, I, would, I can understand an ignorant believer saying this. But the Pope, the successor of St. Peter, just announced that there are many different ways to God. Did you hear it publicly? Oh, why are you looking at me like that? Well, there's not. The Bible makes it so clear there is only one. And I will tell you something. If you think there's many ways to God, you need to open your Bible and get your mind renewed because that is heresy and it's a lie right out of the pits of hell. 
Hinduism, Buddhism, and so on and so on. My doctorate is in theology. That's all I studied was religions. And you can probably understand why I hate it and made straight A's in it. And I'm going to tell you something. It will kill you. Religion will destroy you. The only thing and the only hope for this nation in the world is Christianity. And that's real because it's blood, it's life, it's a name, it's an inheritance, and it's not a joke, and it's not fake. It is a real deal. The body of Christ. So, we are the righteousness of God in Him. I'm going to have to just move on or I'll keep you guys here all day long, I guess. But do you remember last week we were talking about the kingdom of God? And we closed talking about Jesus said, I'm not going to eat or drink the fruit of this vine with you anymore until I eat and drink it with you in the kingdom of God. I took some time last week to make clear you understood the kingdoms within you. The kingdom is now. The kingdom is here. Now Jesus is saying, I won't even take communion with you guys anymore. He was, this, he was saying that when he was breaking it for the last time before his crucifixion. And he said, it's not going to happen no more. The next time this ever happens, we'll be in the kingdom. And then a few days go by, and a couple of disciples are chilling down the road in Luke 24. And Jesus is walking with them. And he asked them, what's going on? And they ask him, how could you not know what's going on? Man, they just crucified the Lord of glory. Are you a stranger? Are you a stranger in Israel? How, how could you not know what's going on? And they're looking at each other. That dude's weird. And so they just walk. Jesus hangs with them all day. And then they all get together. And I know the Bible doesn't say that, but you know, who is this guy? I mean, who is he? He's walking with us, and he's been talking about the prophets. And he's been expounding from Moses all the way up to Christ. Who is this guy? And then he had talked so much that late in the evening when it was time to divide and go, they insisted he stay and eat with them. Still don't know who he is. He has died. He has been buried. He has risen from the dead and no one's touched him. And he's went straight to heaven. He's already cleansed all the heavenly utensils in heaven where Satan sinned. His blood is sprinkled in heaven and in the earth and under the earth. And now he's picked his body up and he is walking in the earth. And his resurrection is so powerful. The Bible says that when Jesus was born that he was not to be admired. He wasn't handsome. That he looked normal. Kind of just plainly. That's what it says. And that's the way he looked. There was nothing about him that made you go, now that is a good looking man. Nothing. He was just plain. And all of a sudden, they don't even know who he is. His visage had changed to the point they have no idea who he is by looks. Because that resurrection is so powerful, it even improved the Son of God. What do you think it'll do for you? Are you hearing me? And so when they sat down, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it. They noticed. And then <laughs> he broke it. And nobody breaks it like he does. And they're like, wow. And then he gave it. And he had taught them, you're the bread. And you are to be blessed. And you're to be broken. And you're to be given to the world. And that's what I'm going to do, Jesus says. I'm the bread of life. And I'm going to be broken so that you who are broken can be put back together. And I'm going to give you this blood and I'm going to give you this bread. And when you eat and drink it, you're going to become one with me. Your sins will be forgiven. Your body's going to be healed. Your mind's going to be made strong. You're going to be redeemed from the fears of the past. You're not going to be afraid of the people that abused you in the past anymore. Your mind is going to be so purged by the power of the blood that the consciousness of your mind, God just supersedes all your thoughts. I'm all for deliverance ministries. Y'all know that. But I'm just telling you. The Holy Spirit can do it in one zap. 
Thank God that there's delivered ministries because some of us need to go through some processes. And when we find out who we are, where we are, let's do it. But all of you should always reach out and know that there's a finished work in Jesus Christ. And when you receive his blood and his body, it's finished in you. You got to walk it out, but it's still finished. It's just like God knows the end as he did from the beginning. We're still walking it out because he knows it doesn't change anything. He knows what you're going to decide, but he didn't change anything. The only thing he did was made a provision for you that every time you messed up, there's a way for you to get out of it. Every one of you, even right now, if you've done something screwy, he's made a provision for you to get out of it. He just does. He never lets you get in a situation that there's no way out. It can look like it, but in him, there's always a way out. So we're going to move into 2021, which is three sevens. And I know this could sound negative, but I think it's really positive. It actually, this year's number means that sin and righteous, uh, sin and rebellion will be revealed. Reveal. And I can tell you from 1985 when I got my first word that God was going to shake ministries in America and everyone that wasn't a God, he was going to close them down. It wasn't weeks later. It started with PTL and other stuff. But what was the rest of the word in 85? When I'm through with ministries I will begin in government and what have we been watching in government for about the past 10 years especially the past four so much corruption is being exposed so much blame is being thrown out but this is the year that it's going to be exposed not just there I'm talking about ministries churches God's cleaning up America oh yes oh I, I know we got the preachers out. Well, it's time for the judgment of God. God is merciful and he is slow to judge. It's you who make him so fast to do it. Oh, yes, it's you. It's you because you're going, he's going to judge now. And he's going, no, I'm not. Just chill. So how do you know he's not going to judge? Because he said if we repent it, that he would heal our land and that we, he would hear from heaven. And he said that he would send us a healing. And so I just believe that he is who he says he is and he'll do what he said he'll do. I know what you're thinking, but what about all of those out there that did not? Well, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? All they needed was just five righteous people. What about all them still committing sin? It's amazing that just a few righteous delivers everybody. Few. God took eight people. And started the whole world completely over again with a new beginning. The number eight means new beginning. And he started, it says, with eight righteous people. And that righteousness of those people is still in the earth, even though unrighteous is out there. But what's happening is we're going to see some stuff manifest. The wheat and tare. We are waiting for the wheat and tare to grow together. And then when they both mature, that's when you come in and you take the wheat are you hearing me but not out it's the tares it says that are taken and thrown into the fire and the wheat is taken for the harvest we're the wheat the world is the tares there's two on a housetop one's taken and one's left the unrighteous are always taken in the bible always oh i know you've been taught the house top left went to heaven it went to hell there's two in a field and one was taken and one was left the unrighteous was taken righteous are always left always unrighteousness is always taken out just go read your bible you can't show me different in the bible no you can't all unrighteousness always blotted out righteousness always preserved the coming of the Lord is preserving the righteous. The unrighteous are being taken out. For you rapture people, you just got it backwards. That's all. Yeah, they're going to be a real rapture. They're going to get snatched out of here like you won't believe. And guess who's going to have the earth? God and all of his people. Just read your Bible. 
Oh, no, brother, I was reading it, and it said, and then shall the end come. Well, just study your Bible. End comes mean the end of an era, not time. The end of the world is not fried up like a marshmallow drifting in space with ashes. The end of the world is the end of a consummation of, of elements and ordinances. Things change. We, had a, we used to live in law. Law came to an end, and it's called the world that was. And now the world that is is called what? Grace. So we're living in grace. So we've already lived, as the Bible says, to the end of that world. So when he's talking about the end of those worlds, it's dispensational. It's not if the earth is going to exist. The Bible says the earth is going to be here forever. And it says as long as it's here, there's going to be seed time. There's going to be a harvest. There's going to be a winter. There's going to be a summer. And so get ready for it. Get ready to prosper. Get ready in your spirit, your soul, and your body to move in prosperity with the Lord. Because the more prosperous you are in him, the more you can do what he says. If he tells you to go untie two donkeys, you are to be able to say, I got two donkeys myself I can just give you. Oh, well. Well, do all of you have your communion? All right, I'm going to have to go find me. I got one. The Lord is good. Now, I know this is a little different. We're used to the cup, but it's okay. I do this by myself, well, with a group, but in my room, my office by myself every morning. And I used to look at these and not like them. I really did. I used to say grape juice and a flat. No, I like the real stuff because it's fermented and it, it's, it's just what Jesus did. But the truth is just, please hear me. There's no power in this either. Whether it be grape juice or real wine. Hello. It's just, there's, what is in this is the act that I do with it. And when I act on the body and the blood, it moves God. And he's not going to be moved by Welch's grape juice or pure wine. He's going to be moved by my faith in his shed blood. And that's what we're getting ready to do. Let me see if you can hear me. Uh, you can hear me good? I want you to just take the blood and the body of the Lord Jesus and just hold it in your hands. Close your eyes if you'd like. And just begin to meditate. Think just for a moment. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much for this day of life. And Father, we thank you that for whatever the reasons may be, it's been your desire that we still be here. We were created by you and for you and for your good pleasure. And sir, we desire to honor you and to bring you good pleasure today. And we announce that we are so pleasured to partake of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus that was given for us and delivers us and heals us and restores us. And Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this body of the Lord Jesus that was broken for us. And you said, Jesus, take and eat. And as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, meaning that I'm putting you back together. And I give you the praise and the glory and the honor for the healing of my body. And I thank you for all of your goodness in Jesus' name. Take the body of the Lord. I like to just rest it on my tongue and just let it melt. And I love to just meditate that I am becoming one with Christ. And that truth that you do become what you eat. And I eat the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. And now, Lord, we just peel the blood back. We thank you for the innocent blood. I thank you for the innocent blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for me. I receive it personally. And I thank you that I stand before you redeemed, blood washed, forgiven, healed, made strong. And I give you the praise, the glory, and the honor that there's not one demonic spirit or not a devil in hell can touch or hurt me. I thank you that you've given me power and authority over every varmint on this planet. And I exalt you and I receive right now the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whew. 
<laughs> Ooh, thank you, Father. Oh, I give you praise. Oh, I worship you today. I just exalt you. And I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your goodness. You're so awesome. So awesome, so awesome, so awesome. Forgiven, healed, made strong and whole. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the faith of God that you've given us. Nothing pleases you but faith. Faith in you. You so awesome and so mighty. And we thank you that when we leave this building today and go into our homes, that we're going to carry a fresh anointing of healing and deliverance into our homes. Father, there's many of us here that some of us are the only ones that even attend church or come and worship you and our homes are full of relatives that just go about their way. We thank you for a spirit of wisdom and revelation of living this in front of them, of them seeing the joy and the excitement of what Jesus Christ is doing in and through us. Heavenly Father, we praise you today that we're not a people of just religious output to come to be seen, but we are hungry and we desire to eat your scroll and it digest it down into our spirit. And Father, we're hungry to be those that see the signs and the wonders and the miracles of our God, touching the people that we love and people that are hurting, people we don't know. Oh, Father, we thank you for all of your goodness today. And I thank you for taking this little church and rocking city of Rock Hill with it. I thank you, Father God, for shaking the county with it. And I think this little church is going to make a big, big, big difference in this local community. I thank you we are going to shake up every demonic spirit that has itself against the knowledge of God. And it is under our feet right now. Hallelujah. Now this is going to sound funny, I'm sure. But I literally waited to the very end just to receive an offering. I'm not going to say anything about money. I don't y'all know me I don't do that I don't I don't believe in tears and all the stuff I believe in faith you should give in faith if I got to play with you with words to get money then your heart's not right when your heart's right with God nobody you're probably already knew what you're gonna do before you got here the Spirit of God speaks to you I, Kathy and I used to go and just sit down at church and before we'd get to church we would we would even sometimes prepare a different offering we didn't know they were going to do that. And they would take up another offer. We had it ready. We was already ready. We was going to give it anyway. But that's just the way the Spirit of the Lord does. We give by faith and not by sight. So the reason I wanted to wait to the end is I want you to realize you've been washed in the blood. You've been cleansed. You've been forgiven. All of you now are like the book of Revelation in the first chapter. You have been made priests and kings before him. There's not a one of you in here that's not a priest and king before God right now who do you think he's king of kings over just just the leaders of the nations only no he's the king of the kings including them and he is the lord of the yeah we lord in the earth that's what we do that's who we are now if you want to go to a typical denominational church you're just a worm and there's nothing to you and you're not worth having and you're going to have to sin every day and you're no good well, just go there just sit there and hopefully I'll see you in heaven God bless you but if you want to hook up with the army of God and you want to say Lord use me I want to be a soldier in the kingdom I'm ready to be out in the marketplace and to share Christ I'm ready to be where something's happening and say hold it let's pray about this Yes, that's what the world's looking for. They're looking for something to happen. I was just in the mall just the other day, and a guy just simply said, my shoulder hurts. I was just trying to put on a pair of britches. He, my shoulder hurts. You know, he was the salesman. I said, can I pray for your shoulder? So sweet, big old fella. He said, sure you can. And I prayed for him, and he got through praying. He thanked me. He said, done his shoulder like that and smile. You know, that didn't sound like or look like anything. But trust me. Things like that not only make an impression on the person you prayed for, there's always somebody watching and listening. And you'd be surprised how many of them want to be like you. Hey, Frank, you and I are sitting in uh, Bojangle. 
and his wife was going through a hard time. And we talked for a minute. And I said, I just wanted to meet you over here because I want to pray with you. So we prayed. We got through praying. And he'd get a big old bald-headed. I ain't got too much against bald-headed people. He had a big old bald-headed fella. He's so tattooed there was no more room for another one. And here he come. He comes walking over there. Boom, boom. And he walks right up to the table. He just looks mean. And he stopped and he looked at Frank and I. And he looked around. He said, that was bold. I said, what? That was bold. People don't do that. I watched you, and I'm going to just tell you, that was bold. And he just walked out. And I looked at Frank. Frank looked at me. I said, he looked bold. You know, that was bold. But anyway, I got tickled. that a big old burly tattooed guy come bouncing over there. Now that's bold. And all we done was prayed for Andrea, for her healing to be made whole and strong and healthy. See, if people just even see you, I just went and had breakfast last week. This happens all the time. Pray. And when I got through, I'm chowing down, and here comes a man and a woman by me and stop. We want you to know we noticed you prayed. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I'm glad, I'm glad you saw that. And they're like, it was so wonderful. And I thought, well, it made them happy. And they did. They went out the door smiling. We're so glad to see that. People really love seeing people in their nation blessing their food, thanking their God, and showing who we are in Christ Jesus out there, not in here. Are you all right? So in our giving, we're just going to give a regular tithes and offerings to the church, and we just want to worship God with it because you're all giving it as priests and kings. Think about it. Remember the kings, the wise men? They brought gifts. Well, God's moved you from sinner poverty attitude to a righteous holy attitude. And now instead of a taker, you're a giver. Amen, it's the truth. And now instead of you being the problem, you're the problem solver. Hey, and instead of the cops looking for you, <laughs> can't nobody find you because you're at home. <laughs> Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you how you have blessed us and you took care of us last year. How much more are you going to take care of us in the future? You are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and you change not. And Father, we take 2021 and we release it into your hands. And by faith, we say, Lord, we're going to give. We're going to bless the kingdom of God. We're going to win souls. We're going to see people come back to God. Families being restored. Sickness and disease must leave. And in the name of Jesus, the power of God, hit our city and bring us a revival that will shake it. Hallelujah. I don't want to watch it in California. I don't want to watch it anywhere else. I want to see it in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And I thank you for anointings that will begin to destroy every yoke of bondage of the enemy. And I give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, would you come forward? And in your offerings, remember, you, uh, you earn your money. You sweat for it. Blood. So your money's not lightly to be taken lightly. It's part of your life. Your money is your expression, your labor. It's so sore muscles sometimes for some of you. Uh, for others, it's probably that tired brain. Your brain works harder than your muscle. But whatever, you release it into the kingdom of God. And as you release it with faith, then God releases the kingdom of God back into you. Let's stand up on our feet. My secretary has on the on the internet the stuff about the firewall from those that we're interceding with and if you would like to get a copy of that some of you have and i'm glad you have and you will see our prayers of declarations and our prayers of decrees and what we're doing in the mornings and what we're praying over and if you'd like to just join us yourselves the best you can i i wish there was some things you know how bad i want to tell y'all some things i'm serious i can tell you this one <laughs> Investment-wise, the, the prophets are saying between now and April that 
this is the best time to invest and that after April, begin to walk very cautious. That's the word of the Lord. And there's a biotech knowledge. Okay? They're talking about it big time. The prophets are. And they're saying to the body of Christ, don't let this one sneak by you. This will be a big one. So if you want to make some investments, nobody's telling you to do it. Just go check it out. Hello? Bio? Knowledge? And so it's going to be a great year. Might be a war. It's going to be a great year. Somebody in your family might go to heaven. You might go to heaven. It'd be a great year, won't it? Anytime I go to heaven, it's going to be great. It's not, and it shouldn't be anything less than that. All right, are you guys got your hammer? You got your spiritual hammer? I better be careful. I done cracked everything in this church with this thing. Well, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this people that's so great. <laughs> I'm standing up here bald headed with a wooden hammer. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I just know this looks funny to the devil. But I just want to announce to all the kingdom of hell that I'm excited that I am armed, and I'm excited that I'm prepared, and I am excited that there is nothing by any means the enemy can do to touch me. I decree that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Your righteousness is of God in Christ Jesus. And therefore, church, rise up and just take your rightful place. Take your hammers. Let your tongue be that pen of the ready writer. Come on, church. Rise up. Take your place. As you begin to speak my word, saith the Lord, will I not confirm it? Have I not confirmed it? Am I not the same yesterday, today, and forever, says the Lord? Hey, speak my word and watch me move in Jesus' name. Boy, that's so simple, but so powerful. I love you. God bless you. Go do the word, and I'll see you next Sunday with a powerful ready. Do the word. Hey, come on now. Somebody ought to praise him.